The setting of the scene is 1888 in Quincy, Alabama, near a set of train tracks that cross through a wooded area near the Crossman's home. Papa and Sarah Jane have just come across a stop train along these tracks and stopped to learn more about the Halton train. During their discussion, they received important information about the special journey and cargo of the stop train. Crabby Josiah Meeks here, he got us a load of Apache, meanest bunch of cutthroats ever walked on two feet. Heard tell them, come through Mobile a while back, caused quite a stir then. Was it they were being held over at Fort Pickens in Pensacola? That's strange, I thought. Papa had never mentioned anything about Apaches before, but then again, he wouldn't talk about them unless they had something to do with food, clothing, or the farm. Yeah, I've been guarding them at Fort Pickens every sticky hot day since they got here in October of 1886. A few months shot, two years. Are they going back to where they came from? The government ain't never let them go back to the southwest. Not in this life. We taking them to Mount Vernon, about 30 miles north of Mobile. Just waiting for that work that the southbound tracks are clear. Next week, I'm out of this man's army, and I'm going back to Ohio, and I'm coming back south of Mason Dixon line, again, the line inside of judgment. Amen. A sibling stepped out of the fifth coach, dressed much like Apache. He had on a plain white shirt, a vest, brown trousers, and knee-high boots. Although he wasn't an Indian, he wasn't like the other white men. I was surprised when the soldiers addressed him as Mr. Ryan, because he looked no more, to be no more than 21 years old. And when Mr. Ryan snapped an order, the troops moved swiftly and unlocked and opened the third coach. Through the open window, I heard Mr. Ryan speak to one of the Indians in what I supposed was Apache. Then he spoke again in English. Come, Geronimo. The face of the woman across from Geronimo was seized with concern. She jumped to her feet, saying something to Mr. Ryan. I couldn't make it up. It sounded like a question. A boy sitting next to Geronimo seemed to be worried, too. Mr. Ryan answered in a calming, respectful voice. Nothing is going to happen to Geronimo, Lozen. We're moving him to the front coach. That's all. So Lozen was her name, I thought. The fact that she stood up to, stood up to defend Geronimo when none of the other women did made me curious. There was something special about Lozen. I searched my head for the right word to describe her, and I settled on strong. Strong like Mama. Determined. Four armed guards came to take Geronimo on a short walk from the third to the first coach. One man in the front, two on each side, and one in the back. Though surrounded by soldiers, John was showed no signs of submission, no fear of his cap captors. Nobody had to tell me he was a person the soldiers had a reason to fear. Yet he didn't seem frightening. Lozen and Geronimo were very much like the slaves Pop had told me about. The ones who showed no fear of their white masters. The one the masters called crazy when they fought back or when they didn't break their spirit. I got a good look at the old warriors as they, as he came down the steps of the coach. His head rested squarely on his shoulders the same way. Yes, the strain, straightness in his back that reminded me very much of Papa. Yep, the two men looked nothing alike. Geronimo was right at six feet, solidly built, <coughs> muscular, unlike Papa, who was slender, thin, much taller, more leggy, yet stronger too, in his own way. Buster's yelping grew louder. The soldiers seemed to bother him. Shut that dog up or I'll... One of the corporals leading, Geronimo was ready to hit the, my dog with the butt of his shotgun. I gasped and drew back. Papa moved quickly, putting his body between us and the soldier. Where are you going, Uncle? That'll do, James, and at ease. Just then, Geronimo turned his head slowly and made a small gesture with his hands. Buster stopped barking instantly and sat calmly beside me, his tail flipping from side to side. <laughs> Did you see that? I believe what they say, Geronimo does have magic powers. <laughs> got nothing to do with magic. He's got a way with animals. My wife's got that gift. It's called kindness. It works better than beating on a poor animal. I was more inter interested in the way they'd said about Geronimo. Did he really have magic powers? I looked back to the to one last look at him. But that's when over the shoulders of the soldiers, I saw a boy who'd been sitting next to Geronimo. He, he, he leaped through an open window and rolled into the darkness. He never made a sound. It happened so fast, I wondered if he, he'd really seen him. Meeks, Jameson, Ryan, and 20 other soldiers were 30 feet away from him, yet they hadn't seen or heard a thing. It was as though the boy was invisible, magically invisible, but no, I had seen him.